Um, well, let me just say, uh, you're like, wow, genetics, what are you doing <laughs> talking about carbon? Um, I hope to someday be as, as expert and think tanky as Renal just uh, introduced me, but uh, I do spend a lot of time thinking about this for sure. Um, and I also wanna say it's really special for me to be talking to you in this room because it was right there almost 13 years ago that I attended a Bevan seminar series lecture. Um, I was kind of exiting my postdoc at the UW wondering what I was going to do. And I heard the lecture that changed my life. It was um, Dr. Richard Feely, who is at, at uh, NOAA Pacific Marine Environmental Lab and is literally the godfather of ocean acidification. And it was also uh, uh, Congressman Brian Baird, former Congressman Brian Baird, who with Jay Inslee, I believe, co-authored the Forum Act that led to the US Ocean Acidification Program in NOAA. And so I sat there in the audience and I listened to these two, you know, eminent scientists and then the guy who gets to translate this into policy for the first time. And I was like, wow, I'm gonna spend the rest of my life working on this. So it was one of those rare epiphany moments in my life, but, um, I was wrong because now I'm going to spend the rest of my life working on marine carbon dioxide removal. <laughs> it seems um, two sides of the same coin for sure, but uh, I, it really feels like the most pressing aspect for me as an ocean person to this entire climate change um, problem that we're trying to address. So you're going to be looking at this slide for a minute because there are three sort of points I want to make or things I want to get out here before I start getting into the topic. Um, the first thing I want to say is this is not my research. I work for Washington Sea Grant, which means I talk to a bunch of experts and scientists and occasionally get to participate in some research projects, but mostly I'm the go-between, uh, the public that needs to know this information and the scientists whom I fortunately can mostly understand most of the time, even though I've never taken an oceanography class and probably never will, <laughs> but I spend a lot of time self-learning. Um, so uh, I have this privilege of working with really world-class scientists and community partners. And this talk is my attempt to provide a very high level overview of marine carbon dioxide removal. And there's so much that I'm not gonna get into so I look forward to anything you wanna dive into uh, after the talk. Um, and I also wanna caveat, I've learned this is important. If or when you hear opinions in this talk, these are my opinions. They're not Sea Grant, they're not the University of Washington or those of my federal partners. So hold me accountable. Um, second point is this is only the second time I've ever given a public talk on marine carbon dioxide removal. I kind of came out of the cl carbon closet um, and changed my title from ocean acidification specialist to carbon specialist a little while ago. And to me, it seems like a logical evolution, but if you had asked me five years ago, if I would be spending any time thinking about MCDR, I would have said no way. Um, because the idea of attempting to suck back decades of carbon emissions in a very short um, time frame through industrial processes that we haven't even invented yet. It sounded so fan it sounded so fantastic to me at the time and also scary and also maybe not necessary since we already knew exactly what we needed to do to solve the carbon problem if we would just go ahead and reduce those emissions. But here we are, uh, here I am five years later, we are now at this point, as it said in my poster, where we no longer have the choice. We have to do those steep carbon emissions and we now have to do some forms of CDR if we are going to keep ourselves below that uh, two degrees Celsius um, warming sort of ceiling that we really don't want to go through. So I've accepted that CDR is a necessary part of the solution package now. And I'm working on it because I wanna make sure that as it develops, we do, it does so, you know, I wanna help it develop in an equitable and responsible manner. And now my third point, and many of you will probably relate to this, is that doing this work is, is hard. I mean, and I'm not even doing the work. I'm, I'm being with the people who are doing this hard, hard work. 
and I mean, all climate change work is hard, right? You know, intellectually and emotionally, it's really difficult. But for the ocean scientists who are working in MCBR right now, it's especially hard because there, it's a relatively small scientific community that is all of a sudden just being asked to do so much. I, I mean, probably big investments have happened before in the sciences and I haven't noticed, but I have never seen so much money being poured so quickly from the federal government into an ocean field, $60 million in 2023 alone. And it's just going to keep going. It's just NOFO after NOFO. And these scientists are actually like saying, no, <laughs> you know, I've got all I can handle. And we, we need to build the ocean carbon workforce. And I'll get to that. That's kind of my take home message at the end. But for all of you who are wondering, how does my work, how does the thing I'm interested in relate to or is affected by uh, our carbon problem? Just trust me. Uh, it is, it does. And if you can see ways to tie what you love to do into helping assist this effort, we'll all be better uh, for it. So I think, I think that's, I can take, oh yeah. So I wanted to just empathize a little bit with all these scientists who are working on this problem because even though largely the scientific community has accepted that carbon dioxide removal is necessary, it's not a happy feeling for them. And a lot of them are very uncomfortable because it feels like the cart is way out ahead of the science horse at this point. And this is hard for people who are really dedicated to generating quality information and hoping that it gets used in a responsible manner. And it's hard for them because it feels so risky. Like, will it work? Will it do damage? Um, so I do imagine that many of you feel similarly about climate change and Maybe afterwards we can exchange coping mechanisms um, out over a beer. All right, time to move on. I'll just check my, okay. So the first, first slide, uh, first of all, uh, my friend Jamie Palter at University of uh, Rhode Island, she's an oceanographer, quickly whipped up this little cigarette fossil fuel warning um, to make a point that you will, that you increasingly hear scientists saying. I think the scientific community has really is starting to accept the fact that we need to get really loud about the necessity um, to reduce carbon dioxide emissions. No more pussyfooting around. And any any scientist worth worth their salt in the CDR field is not going to dispute the fact that it is essential to reduce carbon emission carbon emissions, even as we develop MCDR, because all the CDR you can possibly do won't matter if we continue to emit carbon. We won't get to where we need to be. We need to do both. Um, the other thing on this slide, David Ho is a, a very respected oceanographer at the University of Hawaii Manoa, but he's also pretty active on many social media platforms and he tells it like it is. So I've sprinkled a few uh, screenshots of David Ho opinions throughout this talk because basically I agree with him. Um, okay, so next, this, this is probably the only sort of graphy thing I'm going to show today. Um, all three IPCC reports since 2019 have concluded that carbon dioxide removal is needed to, in conjunction with steep carbon dioxide emission reductions, to limit warming to less than two degrees Celsius. And this schematic, oh, oh, what? I'm gonna use my, can you see? Yeah, okay, great. So this schematic shows what it will look like. Um, this gray stuff, this is the carbon dioxide emissions that we are emitting and will continue to emit into the future because there are some very hard to abate, they're called sectors like transportation, air, air travel, especially and agriculture where it's going to be really hard to get fossil fuels out of those sectors. So going forward in the future, we will hopefully be reducing our fossil fuel, I mean, our CO2 and other greenhouse gas emissions, but there will always be some, and this goes out past the end of this century. So the green stuff is all the things that we can and should be doing right now to change us from this trajectory, business as usual, which gets really hot, to below two degrees Celsius here. And you can see that 
even if you do all these green things, you've still got some residual emissions. And if we're trying to get to net zero, which is here, somewhere around 2075, we need to have some additional removal of carbon in, from the atmosphere. And so this blue that's starting to kind of come up right about now, but then gets significantly larger, that's carbon dioxide removal. And these are negative emission technologies or nets. So conventional abatement um, looks like electrifying the grid, um, even capturing carbon at the source when it is still being combusted. That's CCS or carbon capture sequestration. When you do it in the smokestack, that's not CDR. That's carbon we still haven't let out of the barn. Um, net emission technologies that include CDR are when you have to pull it back out of the atmospheres and oceans and then put it somewhere. So I'm not gonna spend too much more time on this um, slide here and there are, oh, other than to say, no, I did, I had some points to make about this, sorry. Um, let's see. Yes, the lion's share of what we have to do are these conventional abatements. Um, just reduce our emissions. The longer we wait to develop and deploy CDR, the more we'll need it and the more quickly we'll have to develop it. So it's a good thing that this blue line is starting right here with some, just the first pilot projects um, are taking place now um, in the US and a few other places around the world. Um, another thing, because because we don't have a lot of CDR right now, and it's really important to reserve it for these hard to abate emissions in the future, we cannot afford to squander any carbon dioxide removal technologies on simple offsets. You know, the kind of things where you check a little box when you make your Amazon purchase and you say, offset my whatever I just bought. That's not okay. Um, there are better ways to decarbonize our economy and 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 that's all the green stuff. We need to remove the our ability to re remove carbon dioxide. We need to reserve it for actual hard to abate emissions in the future. Um, and finally, before I leave this slide, uh, I just want to acknowledge that although the IPCC reports reflect overwhelming consensus in the scientific community at this point, not all scientists agree. We know that we're scientists. We don't agree. Um, and some are very concerned about the feasibility of carbon dioxide removal on a large scale. And they also say it would be a mistake to rely too heavily on it to predict that when we get out here, we will have this ability to continue to withdraw carbon. And they warn that it could provide an unwarranted and risky excuse to just keep doing what we're doing. And I don't blame those people at all. I mean, given our track record as an industrial um, society, I, we haven't really given people much reason to doubt that we like to continue business as usual. So, um, but anyway, if you, if you, for, if you do subscribe to the school thought that it's uh, unavoidable CDR, we can't afford to not stop trying now. And far scarier to me is the idea that currently Neither governments, science, or industry have any realistic, let alone equitable, plan for removing carbon at the speed and scale that we need to be. All right, so how much do we have to remove? Oh, um, this is just helpful to kind of distinguish between what uh, CDR is and isn't. Um, it only refers to things that we do that remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. It doesn't count if, if you plant a tree and it removes carbon dioxide, that's something else. So I'm specifically talking about pulling it out of the atmosphere and oceans and then putting it somewhere. Um, how you do that, there are many different methods. How much we have to remove? Um, shortly, we should be removing, um, by, by 2100, we should be removing 10 to 20 gigatons a year of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. A gigaton, I always have to look this up, is a billion tons. It's a lot. So the next slide will give you a little bit of sense of the scale. Um, I think, no, it won't. We're getting there, sorry. Now I'm gonna talk about specifically marine carbon dioxide removal, not carbon dioxide removal generally. So MCDR, how does it work? 
It simply augments the amazing, tremendous capacity of the ocean to store carbon. The ocean is already holding most of the inorganic carbon um, that that we have, or that, well, I sorry, I, I'm not good remembering numbers, so I'm not going to try and remember the entire sort of carbon sinks and sources slide that I don't have here, but there's a lot of carbon in the ocean. And if we put all the carbon that we emitted, all the inorganic carbon into the ocean and converted it to a safe form, um, which is possible, it would barely increase the amount of total inorganic carbon in the ocean at all. It would be a, a drop in the bucket, but the trick is getting it there. Um, so three ways to do it. These are the major ways. Um, ocean alkalinity enhancement, Think of it like putting a big Alka-Seltzer in the ocean. Um, that sounds flip, but essentially you are taking chemical alkalinity and distributing it in the ocean, in the seawater, where it then uh, neutralizes some of the um, acidity in the ocean, neutralizes carbon dioxide, which is the source of that acidity, and that creates a deficit of carbon dioxide in the surface waters of the ocean. And then the ocean can act as a sponge and pull some extra carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. So you're basically just ramping up the ocean's ability to act as a sponge for atmospheric carbon dioxide. Biotic cultivation and sequestration, there's many flavors. People will argue whether or not blue carbon and mangroves and seagrasses are part of this. I think not. Um, when you're talking about MCDR, you're really talking about open ocean type things, in my opinion. And the little picture of growing kelp um, pretty much sums up what people mean when they talk about biotic MCDR. Grow a lot of kelp and then figure out something to do with it and put it, put that kelp carbon in a place where it won't come back for at least a thousand years. That's the goal. And then the third form here, um, electrochemical CO2 stripping basically uses a lot of electricity of course, it would have to be renewable in order to um, uh, be effective, but it uses a lot of electricity to break apart the water molecules in seawater into their acid and base components, do something with the acid, put the base back out there where the base will then neutralize the acidity that comes from carbon dioxide that's absorbed by the ocean. And again, sort of ramp up that sponge ability of the ocean. Um, there are so many, that is such a, that's such a simplification of many, many technologies. It's not even funny, but uh, in the interest of time and my ability to remember details, we're going to leave it at that for now. But the important part is that research globally at this point is largely theoretical. It is just leaving the bench tops. So this is a very nice schematic from the Ocean Visions. Um, which is a wonderful uh, organization that is doing a lot of work on marine carbon dioxide removal right now. And there are even more flavors of MCDR here than I just described, but these are the three um, that I did talk about. So um, ocean alkalinity enhancement, uh, the macroalgae sequestration and electrochemical carbon dioxide removal. I am not going to spend right? A whole lot of time um, going into the details of these big three, as I'm going to call them here. But uh, basically, this picture does a much better job of showing what is supposed to happen than the way I just explained it. And you will note there's a lot of dump trucks with stuff in them um, in this slide. And yes, if you are talking about spreading minerals in the coastline or in the surface waters, those minerals have to come from somewhere. And in many cases, you need to mine them. So when you're doing your carbon accounting and you're thinking about all the carbon you will suck out of the atmosphere and sequester through this method, you also have to remember all the carbon that will be emitted. Um, even if these trucks someday are fully electric, there's a lot of there's a lot of intensive industrial activity to support this particular method. Um, electrochemical ocean carbon dioxide removal. I bet you can't read uh, the font very well. Uh, there's a lot going on here, but basically you can see seawater comes in. So you have a coastal um, facility, electricity is added, the acid and the base are separated, 
the acid goes off and at the moment there's a market for it um, because uh, many industries use hydrochloric acid, for example. And then the base is returned into the ocean through a, a variety of options, but ultimately it does, um, it neutralizes the carbon dioxide that's already dissolved in the water and more is pulled out of the atmosphere. Um, this, this slide looks friendlier because it's all green and, and foresty and natural. Uh, this is a great example of a nature-based climate solution. Uh, but the idea is you grow kelp at the surface, like plants on land, macroalgae absorb a lot of carbon dioxide and incorporate it into their tissues. And if you can sink those tissues deep enough in the ocean, um, the idea goes, it will stay out of commission for quite a while. And the ocean is a very big place and there's a lot of, of empty space uh, in the ocean that some people think would be a great place to put kelp. Other people are horrified by the idea. I personally worry a lot about the, uh, the uh, effect on acidification because that kelp could easily decompose in the bottom of the ocean and remineralize and all that biological carbon would then re-enter the seawater as, as dissolved carbon dioxide and then come back to bite us when the surface waters come up and upwell on our coastlines. So, um, and another note about nature-based solutions. This is one of my personal opinions. Uh, they're always more popular when you conduct a survey and you say, people, what would you like to see happen in order to, to combat climate change? Do you want a big facility on your coastline or would you like a kelp farm? And they're like, of course, we would like a kelp farm. I love kelp. I get phone calls from people because I don't get to do just MCDR yet. I also do a lot of work with the kelp aquaculture industry and people are so excited to become kelp farmers and save the world. And I have the somewhat sad uh, reality check task of telling them that it's they're, it's not going to save the world, um, even if you can get a permit, which is a whole nother story. But I personally feel like it's we're asking a lot of nature. Nature is already down. Nature is under stress right now from climate change, and it will be increasingly so in the future. So to pin our hopes on nature, all of a sudden doing more of what it's good at when it really isn't feeling great, that seems a little um, optimistic. So, and maybe it's just because we don't know enough yet about these more technological uh, solutions like uh, ocean alkalinity enhancement and electrochemical um, mitigation that those seem, at least to me, they seem perhaps more feasible. Um, I feel like it's really hard to get nature to do what you want it to do, especially when you haven't been very nice to it. So, um, and then the one final thing about nature-based solutions, and this isn't exclusively true about them, but it is important. We've all seen forests burn up lately. So there's a permanence problem in any scheme that relies on uh, trees or macroalgae or topsoils to store carbon because those ecosystems can be disturbed and the, that captured carbon can, in those cases, sometimes be re-released. So permanence is a little more difficult to verify and, and trust in that case. All right. Oh, wait, this one. Huh. This uh, slide, when I first saw it, uh, when Paul McElhaney showed it, made a huge impression on me. And it, it's at this point that I gave up completely on kelp cultivation as a potential MCDR solution. Because the idea of a half kilometer wide band of cultivated kelp along every coastline on the entire planet, including places where kelp doesn't even like to grow, when a few seaweed, prospective seaweed farmers that I know can't even get permits for a five to 10 acre seaweed farm in Puget Sound seemed a little far-fetched to me. And also there is that unanswered question of what to do with the kelp. Um, so these other two uh, uh, examples are equally daunting. So just think, we need to scale up our ability to conduct MCDR by several orders of magnitude to be effective. All right. Um, so what do we do? How can we make this work? This is just my little bullet list of things that would really help a lot. Unfortunately, some of them are happening. Um, so I'm, the next set of slides are, to, are 
examples illustrating each of these sort of critical principles for successful MCDR. Um, ingenuity, integrity, responsible science, MRV, every, you'll hear MRV all the time in this uh, sphere, monitoring, reporting, and verification. How do you know that the thing you think you're doing is happening and how well is it happening? And MRV is essential because this is going to be, this will only succeed really, unfortunately, in our capitalist system, global society, if people can make money off of this. And MRV is the ticket to monetizing uh, this work. We need ethical frameworks for how to conduct research and later on how to deploy at scale. We need to regulate this market. It is an entirely unregulated market at this point. And maybe, just maybe, we need to we need to change the way we think um, about how, well, globally, many of you probably are, are, uh, are already thinking about how we as humans live on this planet. Um, but as a global society, we need to make a big change. So this is a fun slide for me. This is my example of ingenuity. These are our homeboys here. Um, Alex and Julian are uh, in the School of Oceanography, they are on leave to start up a company called Banyu Carbon, one of many, 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 many marine carbon dioxide startups. But they really do embody ingenuity for me. Their technology is quite different from the majority. Um, rather than relying on, oh, we'll get some renewable energy to power our uh, technology, their process makes its own energy. It is a light driven process um, that actually generates electricity while it is splitting the water into its acid and base components. It is an electrochemical type of MCDR, but it solves the energy problem, which is really the elephant in the room for that type, that type of approach. And, oh, there's just so many other great things about it. And you don't have to uh, listen to me, uh, try to remember how it works, because I just saw this last week. Um, the PCC Spring Seminar is all about, mostly about MCDR. I'm going to be at every single one of these, and Alex is going to be talking about Banyu Carbon um, very soon. And that's really exciting, because he they only gave their first public presentation at the end of January. It's the first time I heard uh, Alex give his talk publicly. So they've been the uh, They've been getting a lot of funding, a lot of support and interest, and they just didn't feel ready to talk about it until recently. So I encourage you to go to this talk. It's a fantastic talk. All right, we need integrity. So this uh, shady uh, in the dark poster child for bad actors in the ocean space. This is, and I don't mind um, sort of throwing this guy under the bus. It's pretty accepted that what he did was wrong. This is. Russ George, this is from uh, who in several, probably over 10 years ago now, um, did an unauthorized ocean iron fertilization experiment in the waters off of Haida Gwaii uh, in British Columbia. And um, yeah, the experiment, it wasn't an experiment. He didn't tell anyone he was going to do it. There was no ability to even monitor things much after the fact, but we need to conduct all of these pilot experiments for all of these technologies in a very open, transparent, collaborative way, not the way this guy did it. Um, there's another flavor of integrity that I wanna address here. And I'll just read this quote from the MIT review because they said it really, really well. Critics fear that as more companies develop net zero emission plans, the public relations and financial incentives are pushing players on all sides of this market in a single direction toward developing, funding, accrediting, selling, and buying as many carbon credits as possible, even if some of the practices have questionable benefits or could inflict environmental harms. A host of startups are pursuing a variety of novel ways to produce or sell the credits, backed by venture capital investments and hefty fees for each ton of carbon putatively sucked up and stored away. But a growing number of researchers and critics fear that some of the science is getting lost amid the carbon removal gold rush. This is as true today as it was when this was written a year or so ago. And 
We just need to um, be very, very clear-eyed. When someone is trying to sell you a carbon credit, look under the hood. All right, codes of conduct. This is the uh, um, responsible research. Codes of conduct are being developed. Um, they are good. Uh, now uh, we need people to listen and abide by these codes of conduct. But the scientific community is really rising to the challenge and is aided uh, by the sort of nonprofit um, boundary organization sector. So it's not like we don't know, well, we don't know completely how to do this, but people are trying very hard to develop rules to develop and deploy MCDR in a responsible way. Um, but we need to keep the pressure on always. Um, here's that MRV, monitoring, reporting, and verification. And this is a David Ho tweet. Um, and actually he's just, uh, you know, reiterating what another um, very great uh, thinker in this sphere is saying, and that's that uh, it is, as I just said, a significant danger that our carbon market, which is completely voluntary in the ocean, um, is built on false pretense. You have to um, know how to measure um, and verify uh, that what you think is happening is happening. And unfortunately, that really is not the case um, in almost any type of MCDR right now. Um, okay, so there, as I said, there there is so much enthusiasm for the marine carbon credit market, and yet there's practically no evidence that current voluntary credits are accomplishing anything as of yet. So it's all hands on deck to do the science, develop the models, assess ecosystem impacts, create the regulatory and financial frameworks to support high quality carbon credits. And fortunately, there are very, very good people, both in government and academia, but also in the private sector who are working on this right now. So I do have faith um, that, this may, that this may happen. And then we need that ethical framework. We need to remove the carbon in an equitable way. And what that means, what that looks like is, for real, prioritizing the interests of those most gravely affected by climate change. This is a mantra, you hear it all the time. I'm watching this sort of unfold in real life as, uh, as startup companies are starting to try to do pilots, in-water pilots um, in the West Coast. And they're sometimes they call me and they're like, where should we do this? Where is nobody going to put up resistance. You know, that's what they're really hoping for is that they'll be able to get their permit and do their experiment and learn what they need to do without having to have a really unpleasant um, uh, public backlash. And sometimes uh, those people think that the best place to do things like this would be where the communities can't put up that resistance. Because what I've seen is almost no one is very keen on the idea of these types of experiments, even though I believe that they are at this point at the pilot level quite benign environmentally. Uh, justifiably, people are, are, are not that enthusiastic when they hear about it. And if you plan to do something like this in, you know, central Puget Sound, a lot of people are going to say no. A lot of wealthy people, a lot of people with influence. And if you plan to do it somewhere else where the the um, communities aren't as able to get engaged and say no if that's their right. I mean, if that's their choice, those projects are more likely to go ahead there. So we need to prioritize those people who are affected by climate change and also by these experiments. And those people need to be part of the process at a global level as nations and also at community level in the discussions about how these pilot projects unfold. And they must ultimately benefit. If someone, if a community decides that they're going to allow a small alkalinization facility to do, uh, to, uh, you know, exist in their community, they should be benefiting in some way from that particular project, whether it's through jobs, whether it's through some kind of buffering for local acidification. Um, and those kinds of conversations need to happen with communities to decide what they want and what they think is, is um, 
worthy compensation for what they may be giving up. All right. Um, this is just to, this is just preface the next slide. There is so much money being poured into carbon dioxide removal right now um, overall. Uh, there's a lot of research investment by our federal government, but that is dwarfed by this gold rush um, to start generating credits and selling them. Um, and again, many of these credits aren't actually accomplishing what, what we need them to do, but they're being sold nonetheless. And as of this month, $2.4 billion have been traded in carbon credits. I'm not sure if that's US or global. All right. Finally, this is, um, and th this is, this is the point I want to make. Um, I, I find myself becoming increasingly sort of anti-capitalist uh, as I age, and it's distressing to me to think that we, that are realistically the tool that we will need to use to make this happen is capitalism, because it's kind of hard to imagine that we can buy and consume our way out of the problem that we've created by buying and consuming. Um, and this book, The Value of a Whale, is a dense read. There's a lot of economics in it. I learned a lot. Um, speaks to that. Uh, unfortunately, I read it all the way to the end. She did not have a solution, um, but she does. She does. Uh, this author does uh, really uh, illuminate a lot of things about our economic system that may, will make it challenging uh, to overcome climate change. And then I just like this. Uh, cartoon, so I, I put it in there. All right, maybe the answer is public ownership. I do feel like there needs to be a very strong role for government, both in the research and in the regulation of this market. Um, I just think, you know, government is slow and government is frustrating. Um, people will tell you that, but I think collectively, sometimes we make better decisions than individually, especially when we are motivated by personal gain. So I do personally feel like there should be a, a heavy dose of public ownership as this sector develops. Hope we can pull that off. And then finally, this is that uh, closing slide about what if we just changed the way we thought about everything? Um, I'm not sure exactly what this looks like, but uh, I think probably some of the principles that Robin Wall Kimmerer uh, explains so beautifully in braiding sweetgrass are the direction we should be heading. Ideas about reciprocity and just taking what you need and giving back. And finally, what we really need to have MCDR succeed is all of you, as I said before, we need to grow the ocean carbon workforce in a humongous way. Um, my friend Simone Allen, uh, senior oceanographer up at NOAA PMEL, told me recently, she said, it takes 10 years to make an oceanographer. That's a baby oceanographer. And so many trained PhDs who are in academia and government right now are getting lured away into the private sector. And I can't say I blame them. Um, for one, I think the paycheck is great. For two, I think it feels very, um, it feels like you're closer to the problem, closer to working on the problem. You know, the, the great carbon dioxide team up at NOAA PMEL, they've been conducting long-term carbon measurements for decades. They are responsible really for what we know, um, they and many other colleagues around the world, but that's how we know what's happening in the carbon system and in our planet's carbon budget. And that's really, really important work and they need to keep doing that. And now they're also being um, passed uh, with also uh, diving in and, and spending a lot of their effort and, and resources on uh, marine carbon dioxide removal and understanding it and conducting these pilots and developing the MRV. And they just need more people. Um, so yeah, I don't wanna tell people not to go into the private sector, but um, if anyone is considering or interested in working uh, for NOAA, I think they could they could really really use you. So I think I may have actually finished early. Yeah, time for questions. Thanks.
question? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Anybody have any? Yeah. I want to thank you for a very interesting talk. The interface between the legal and the technological and the financial, I've been following some of the work on growing algae to produce fuels, mm -hmm. and they've flown airplanes on, on algal fuels. But they cost twice as much as petroleum-based fuels. And if they ever get the price down to where they're really competitive, I think the private sector is going to just roll all over them and destroy them. I mean, can you explain they, what you mean by why would they do they that? Produce enough petroleum type products from algal growth. Yeah. The people who make their money selling petroleum are not going to be very happy. Yeah, I think I agree with you. And, <laughs> yeah. Right now, the military has apparently funded a lot of the research for growing algae to produce aviation fuels. Probably the military and also the Department of Energy. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. And, you know, Sometimes acting in concert. In, in subject, but if it ever comes to a real market level fight, most of us aren't prepared for that. Yeah. Um, does anyone need me to repeat anything about the question? Could you hear? I mean, it was an, it was an observation really wasn't a question. Um, but that's true. And one of the things that really troubles me is the degree to which oil and gas industry is embracing CDR for several reasons. They're powerful. Um, they can do what they want. They can make the argument that they are best equipped to carry things out on a large industrial scale. They know how to pump things. They know how to pump things around. They know how to pump up water. They know how to pump things underground. And um, it's just a huge industry that um, also feels, you know, if, if CDR and renewable energy take off the way we need them to, oil and gas will feel threatened, of course. And so, yeah, you're right. I, I do worry that Things will get steamrolled, I think, as you said. Promising uh, technologies and sectors could get steamrolled. Um, I also worry that it kind of doesn't matter what we scientists think or, tr or what kind of guidance um, we try to create uh, because they don't have to listen. Uh, Occidental and Exxon can, can do what they want. And while we are you know, in our sort of academic ivory tower, uh, thinking, oh, if we just do the science and develop some guidelines and ways to kind of conduct this research responsibly, everyone will listen to us. And I'm pretty sure that the other, you know, academia and federal uh, and state um, scientists will, but we don't have a lot of influence over the private sector. So that, that is concerning. Uh, there's a question behind you, Ronald. Yeah, go ahead. I'm really interested in the scale of governance of the research question. Um, and climate change is a problem with a global scale. Um, a lot of these technologies you're describing, it's immense need to scale them up. But they're also, all of these technologies require, it seems like pretty local siting and, you know, help farm along the entire coast of Washington and so on. You're working at a, a state agency. I'm curious about what you see as the optimal scale for governance and regulation of these measures. Well, I think in the US, and I really can only speak for the US, I think the EU sort of will follow the same uh, framework. Um, I feel like it has to start at the very top. Um, it's really been interesting. Um, I'm setting up actually a, a community of practice for marine carbon dioxide removal for the Pacific Northwest. And we're having an in-person meeting to launch this community next month in Seattle. And I am just so excited because I got people from the EPA and the U.S. Army Corps to come to this. Um, and they are uh, reputedly difficult 
to access um, for people, for scientists um, and startups who are trying to develop uh, develop the permits uh, to carry out their pilot projects. Um, so far, it's been kind of talk to the hand. And I'm really thrilled that we'll have some people from these top levels of the regulatory um, uh, arena in person at this um, so that we can start to develop some productive relationships and conversations. Um, but what I've learned is that, uh, well, the permitting process, such as it is, starts at the top. You develop a permit um, and you know it will be reviewed uh, by the EPA. Um, if you do things that the US Army Corps cares about, mostly stirring up sediment and putting things in navigable waters, uh, they will be there too. NOAA is there, of course, because they're watching to see what kind of environmental impacts um, it will be. And then once you sort of clear that level, then it starts to trickle down and there are subsequent reviews at the state and finally probably at the county level. Um, one thing that it, that everybody has sort of like just grokked in the last couple of years is that things like the Clean Water Act, which come into play when you try to permit um, even research projects, they were not designed for this. In the 70s, as we built up our, our environmental protection regulations, they were designed to keep people from putting things in the ocean. And the assumption is, if you don't do that and you leave the ocean alone and it does its thing, it will be better off than if you, you know, pollute it. Nowadays, we are at this point where we need to put things in the ocean to help the ocean. And if we don't do those things, the ocean will get worse and worse. So a lot of people, there's a, um, it's called permitting reform. That's a buzzword in Washington, DC. People are like, we need to start all over. We need a whole separate type of regulation for this type of climate intervention that doesn't presume that you are a bad person trying to do bad things. And you know, you have to prove to the nth degree, which takes time and money, um, that you're not. You need a separate type of regulatory structure. And that's just within the US. Nobody really knows yet how to do this sort of like, what do you do in international waters? There are like model frameworks that people who are really smart about those things are writing now and sort of just putting out there and they come up at conferences and they show up on things like Ocean Vision's website where people are saying, hey, we're thinking about it and this seems like a good way to treat this, but adoption is a whole nother thing. And then, you know, this is really the sort of thing that probably has to get hammered out at uh, COP events and, and through the UN. Where are we now, COP 28? It's a slow process. <laughs> so, so I think, uh, I don't know how we can do these things that we need to do carefully that require trust um, and, and buy-in from communities at the speed that we need to do it. But we kind of need to do them both at the same time. Yeah. Mama, you had a question? Yeah, it's following on from this from getting to the question that we have an interesting way the other evening. Is do we wait particularly to address climate change? Is this something that should happen bottom up or top down? And we have different opinions on this. I would love to hear a, a bottom up scenario that you maybe no. proposed. Yeah, I'm not nothing practical, but it, I um, I think what is important is we have to, we will get to a point where we realize that everything we do has an impact, and I'm not quite sure that we are there yet. And we have to think twice about driving. We have to think twice about flying. We have to do think twice about all of the things that we can change mm -hmm. immediately locally, and do see that as our contribution. If we're not doing that already, and um, at the moment we're saying no, it's the government's responsibility to give us the cars and or make it easier for us to meet those demands. I don't want to change my lifestyle as long as the government provides me that means to do that. So are we are we going to get to a point where we almost hit pandemic style crisis and we have, you have to hit the pause button on the world and say we have a choice here, it's going to be really nasty and we have to rethink or uh that's where I would place my money. Yeah. 
I think we're going to get to it. We re we respond when things reach a, a tangible crisis that most people can feel. The problem is we don't necessarily respond in the best way in that moment. But yeah, um, you know, I don't know. What can we do to <laughs> to steer away from that? Um, I think. I think be loud um, in the best way that we as scientists know how to be. Uh, don't be afraid to use your voice. Don't shy away from engaging in uh, divisive discourse, not divisive, we don't wanna be divisive, but um, I feel like gone are the days when anyone can justify just doing their science, publishing and hoping that the message gets out that way. And um, you can argue with me later, but I also feel like we have to stop worrying about, you know, um, not overstepping and potentially jeopardizing our professional status. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Yeah, I know, but data in practice that is that is hard and scary. I get that, but yeah, but the alternative is, um, you know, not great. Yeah. So, yeah. thank you. Um, any last question? Okay, right. then let's thank um, Meg for uh, one last time. <laughs>